Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Alicia Lord. I'm with uh, OJJDP's National Training and Technical Assistance Center, and we are the technical hosts for today's event. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes before we get started to discuss a few features in WebEx and a few announcements to keep in mind. You should see a poll listed on the right side of your screen right now. Please take a moment to fill that out as we get started. Please note that this event is being recorded. Our webinar will be linked to OJJDP's YouTube page and be posted to the OJJDP multimedia page. Past webinar events are archived on OJJDP's YouTube page as well. And for the transcript and support materials, you can contact our help desk. If you have any trouble uploading the event materials, please contact the help desk for materials. And my colleague William will also be sharing a Google Drive link in the chat window, which will allow you to download the presentation. For optimal audio, you can dial in through the WebEx platform or have the system call you. You can also listen on your computer speakers. So there are two options to be joining for audio today. And I'm going to be sharing the materials and you'll have a small, you'll have a pop-up on your screen where you can download them. And then my colleague has also placed the Google Drive link in the chat. All right, please feel free to use the chat feature throughout the session to uh, ask any questions you may have of the panelists. Make sure you hit all panelists before hitting send. And please note that the questions may not be answered today. We will have a, a Q&A session at the end of today's webinar, um, but there are quite a few people on and we received some questions in advance as well. So if we don't get to your questions today, um, you can feel free to reach out to the help desk and we'll try to make sure we get your questions answered. All right, for those of you participating in today's webinar as a group, please take a minute and help us count. If you're viewing by yourself, there's no need to type in anything at this time, but if you are viewing in a group, please go to the chat window and type in the total number of additional people in the room with you today. Attendees signed in will receive a feedback email with a certificate of attendance. And if you are joining as a part of a group, just let us know and we will send you the group validation form, which is where you can request a certificate. Those do come in directly from WebEx and it's an automated email. So please be sure to check your spam folder if you don't see it. All right, and this is a general layout of our web event today. Thank you for joining us. And I will now turn it over to Caitlin, who is today's moderator. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining. I'm Caitlin Sill. I'm a social science research analyst with the National Institute of Justice, and I'm excited to be moderating, moderating today's webinar. The purpose of this webinar is to provide you with an introduction to youth hate crimes and youth hate groups, including providing an understanding of hate groups, how they've evolved, and a definition of hate crimes. Additionally, the panel will identify some promising practices for prevention and intervention to help us build protective factors and intervene with youth who have committed acts of bias. Finally, we plan to leave time for, um, for question and answer. I'd like to start off with introducing our panelists by giving a very brief snapshot of their extremely impressive credentials. Um, and I'm going to be introducing them all at once in the order in which they will be speaking. So first presenting is Michael Lieberman, who is with the who is the senior policy counsel with the Southern Poverty Law Center in Washington, D.C., with a focus on countering hate and extremism. He joined the Southern Poverty Law Center in May of 2020 after serving as the Anti-Defamation League's Washington Council, where he led the Anti-Defamation League's federal advocacy and legislative lawyering work on civil rights, um, religious freedoms, and hate crime prevention. Michael received the U.S. Department of Justice's 2015 Meritorious Service Award for his leadership in helping to enact and implement the Matthew Shepard and James Beard, sorry, James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act of 2009, and for building coalitions to combat hate crime and hate violence. Next to speak will be Rick Eden, who is the Director of Research at the Simon Weisenthal Center. As co-director of the center's Digital Terrorism and Hate Project, he supervised the production of all 23 editions of the Digital Terrorism and Hate Interactive Report. 
He regularly meets with Facebook, Twitter, Google, and YouTube and other social, network, and social networking companies to give feedback and assist with shaping policy. He has worked extensively with the California Peace Officer Standards and Training, and he has twice testified in congressional hearings as well as conducted many briefings on Capitol Hill. In his 36 years with the Simon Weisenthal Center, he has conducted hundreds of training sessions with law enforcement, educators, civic groups, and schools. Speaking next will be Jess Scoop, who is the founding director of the nonprofit Beyond Barriers. For 25 years, Jeff was known as the national leader of America's largest neo-Nazi party, the National Socialist Movement. In early 2019, he became the highest profile former white nationalist leader in America to ever publicly walk away from hate. Today, he reemerges in the public arena, not as a sensational celebrity story, but as an inspiring example of life-altering transformation, transformative change. Jeff's life was forever changed through the interpersonal relationships and dialogue with those he once vilified. Once America's most notorious neo-Nazis, he is now an inspirational speaker for Conscious Campus, where he, tire, where he, and he, holds, and he tirelessly holds talks, lectures, and workshops from his unique vantage point. And last but not least, Lorraine Tiven is a curriculum specialist for the Ju um, Justice Education Center. She has developed two comprehensive programs. The first, the Bias Crimes Diversion Project, is an alternative sentencing program for youth and adult offenders of bias crimes. The second is a school-based adaptation of the successful bias crimes diversion strengths-based approach, which is titled the Bullying and Diversion Project. Prior to her work with the center, Lorraine served as the National Director of Education Programs for the Anti-Defamation League and provided leadership for the league's national and international anti-bias programming for pre-K to, um, to 12 schools. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those of you in the West. Um, I'm Michael Lieberman. I use he, him pronouns. Thanks to OJJDP for uh, including us in this program. Thank you for the series that you all are doing on uh, the range of issues. I hope folks are familiar with the Southern Poverty Law Center. Um, we, I would say one of the best things about SPLC is that we, through our, though we work on law, legislation, against bullying, against hate crime, against extremism, our principal focus is really on prevention. And if you think about it, it's much better to prevent harassment, intimidation, bullying in schools, hate crimes, than to respond to it afterwards. You may know SPLC from our annual Year in Hate and Extremism report. Uh, that report came out um, just yesterday. Um, we have a definition that we use. I know Rick and Jeff are gonna be talking really primarily about hate groups. SPLC defines a hate group as an organization um, whose beliefs, practices, attack, malign an entire class of people simply because of who they are, their personal characteristics. Um, this um, slide is wrong, but it had to be wrong because the uh, data was embargoed until yesterday. But uh, this is what the map looks like, but with different numbers as of yesterday. Um, there were 733 active hate groups and another 488 anti-government groups. It's important to keep in mind that the vast majority of hate crimes are not committed by members of organized hate groups. To address the problem of hate violence in schools or elsewhere, we have to know how many there are. Since 1991, the FBI has been collecting hate crime data from the nation's 18,000 state, local, and tribal law enforcement organizations. Data drives policy, and our data is not very good. Uh, these are numbers from the FBI. You can see that the slide says that there were 8,052 single bias incidents. There were a total of 8,263 total incidents. Um, we will go into this a little bit more in depth, but you can see just from this slide that race and ethnicity this year, meaning 2020, the most recent data from the FBI, and every year, going back to 1991, race um, has been the most frequent hate crime committed. 
Um, this is total hate crimes. <clears throat> Excuse me, the FBI um, has a um, website that is a little bit difficult to navigate. I can drop a link to it in the chart, in the uh, chat. There were 15,138 of the 18,500 agencies that participated. That means that 3,500 agencies around the country did not report any data. Only about 2,400 agencies reported one or more hate crime. That means that 86% of all the agencies, even those that participated, reported zero, affirmatively reported zero hate crimes to the FBI. <clears throat> These are the numbers starting on the left-hand side, 2020 going down to 2000. And you can see that the 8,263 single bias crimes was the highest number of hate crimes reported to the FBI since 2001, right after 9-11. It was the third straight year of increase. Um, 8,263 is a 13% increase over the 2019 numbers. Um, and this is a very small chart, but it comes from the Anti-Defamation League. And the point is that there's way too many cities over 100,000 in population that either did not report any hate crime, any hate crime data at all, that's the 10 at the top, or they affirmatively told the FBI that they had zero hate crimes. And this is the crux of the problem with hate crime data. All of the reporting is voluntary. We are working legislatively to change that, to tie federal funding to credible reporting. This is not credible. 70 cities, over 100,000 that did not report any data or affirmatively reported zero hate crimes. This is an example of the bar graph, the red, are the participating agencies start at the top. Those are missing in action entirely. And then the red line, those that participated, but then the orange line, those that reported one or more, as I mentioned in the most recent year, 86% of the agencies that quote, participated reported zero hate crimes. This is hate crimes by percentage. The orange line is the racial um, hate crimes. You can see that race-based hate crimes have always been first. Um, Religion-based hate crimes, with very rare exceptions, two times. Sexual orientation has been second. Every other time, religion has been second. This is the hate crime breakdown in a pie chart. This is what it looks like um, in a pie chart format. Um, the FBI started disaggregating juvenile hate crime only in 2015. And you can see that every year, since 2015, there has been more juvenile hate crimes reported. Um, this is the number of incidents. Um, that's the number of people um, that are targeted, the victims. And this is the perpetrators uh, that goes from 2015 to 2020. I think the bottom line, I, I, uh, Lorraine has excellent resources in her select bibliography. She may talk about this too, but there, Juveniles are disproportionately perpetrators and victims of hate crime. This is juveniles versus uh, overall number of hate crime. Um, to break down, it's very useful to have this data. You can see that in the year 2000, 28 anti-Muslim hate crimes in the entire country were reported. And the next year, a 1,700% increase. Those are mostly in the fourth quarter after 9-11, but you can see that uh, effective response by government and state officials lowered those numbers almost immediately and with uh, they have been disturbingly high, but nothing like what we saw after 9-11. Uh, these are the anti-Jewish hate crimes. Um, the number of uh, crimes against Jews, you don't have to be a former staffer for the Anti-Defamation League to be disturbed by the fact that year in and year out, something like 55% to 80% of all the religion-based crimes are directed against Jews and Jewish institutions. Um, that is a very disturbing uh, piece of information. One of the reasons why the data matters is because it, it talks about trends. You can see that in the year 2003, 
to 2008, there were uh, an increase in anti-Hispanic crimes. That happened again in 2015 to 2019. And both of those time periods were times when there was very, very substantial public policy discussion about uh, immigration, and that had a dramatic increase in the number of crimes. We think there is a relationship between um, xenophobic and anti-immigrant rhetoric and violence directed against Hispanics and also the Asian American community. The AAPI community, a very, very dramatic increase from 2019 to 2020. There are thousands of incidents that also have been um, tra tracked and tabulated by AAPI community members and organizations that have been established for this issue. There was a very important piece of legislation passed in May called the COVID-19 Hate Crime Act directed to try and do more about this uh, very, very significant increase, a 64% increase over 2019 numbers. And unfortunately, the 2021 numbers are also, um, every indication indicates uh, in increasing numbers. Um, gender identity and gender-based hate crimes have only been tabulated since 2013. Um, this, the number of gender identity hate crimes is really disturbing as well. It is now 3% of all hate crimes nationally, which is uh, remarkable when you think about people in the uh, trans community are not likely to trust the police, and yet you have to call the police and report that you've been the victim of a hate crime. So if these numbers are um, so dramatically uh, significant, imagine what they are if um, they were not underreported. The FBI has an excellent hate crime training guide, and I think it's weird for a civil rights lawyer that works for the Southern Poverty Law Center to say that the FBI has an excellent hate crime training guide, but the reason that they have an excellent hate crime training guide is because staffers at SPLC and ADL and the NAACP, and the National Center for Transgender Equality, the Human Rights Campaign, the American Association of University Women worked with them, wrote scenarios, wrote definitions, and the FBI was a partner enough to include them in their guide. And then you can say that it's a really good guide because you worked on it and they use what you uh, provided and it is really a helpful resource. The ADL keeps um, all hate crime statutes on their website. Um, there are 46 states in the District of Columbia that have state hate crime laws, um, but the law is a blunt instrument. Um, there are um, bullying laws too. They are not criminal laws in the main. This, you, I hope many people are familiar with stopbullying.gov. It's a very rich resource. And the page that I pulled out to show you is the page that goes to laws, policies, and regulations on stopbullying.gov. They have every single state hate crime, um, state bullying law in the country. All 51 states have uh, bullying prevention laws and um, the stopbullying.gov includes them and has a number of resources to talk about best practices when you're talking about um, anti-bullying laws. Very, very valuable. Um, this is a picture of Matthew Shepard and this is a picture of James Byrd Jr. Both of them were murdered in 1999. Uh, Matthew Shepard, because he was gay, murdered in October of 1999. James Byrd Jr. murdered in June of 1999 because he was black. And it took us, as Lorraine can tell you, 13 years to get the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act passed. My experience as a legislative lawyer is it's not a good thing when they name a law after you. Um, and the Matthew Shepard James Byrd Jr. Hate Crimes Prevention Act, you can see that it's it's um, Division E of a law. That law in that passed in 2009 was the Department of Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2010. Even after 13 years of working on this legislation, the only way to get it passed was to put it on the one piece of legislation that is passed every year for the past 61 years, which is the Department of Defense Authorization Act. The law is a blunt instrument. What we need to do is prevent these hate crimes, this bullying from occurring in the first place. And the rest of my time is gonna be devoted to prevention resources. 
This one is our signature resource, um, SPLC and the Polarization and Extremism Research and Innovation Lab at American University, Parallel. Have a Parents and Caregivers Guide for Online Youth Radicalization, especially during COVID times. Our students, our kids um, are online much more frequently and there needs to be ways for parents and caregivers to see early warning signs of radicalization, of being lured to extremism and to intervene and disrupt. These are um, some bullet points from it. It's been evidence-based. There's some really interesting work that's been done to test it. Um, we're really very high on it. And then I hope folks are familiar with Learning for Justice. It used to be called Teaching Tolerance, um, SPLC's education arm. Um, and imagining digital literacy and working on digital, digital literacy is very, very important. Critical thinking skills is super important to be able to respond to extremism on the web. Um, and that is something that, that we take very seriously too. Um, I hope folks will take a look at these resources. Um, and uh, thanks again to OJJDP. Thanks to all of you for participating. And let me turn it over to Rick Eaton. Thank you, Mike. Uh, for those that have seen possibly previous webinars that uh, in this series, I'm going to show some similar slides, but most of them are are uh, not going to be the same. I'm gonna be talking about our, uh, some of our remediation efforts. But uh, I do wanna talk about uh, uh, extremist groups a little bit. I'm with the Simon Wiesenthal Center and the Museum of Tolerance and the museum uh, folk, uh, is, figures into my uh, later part of my presentation extensively. So uh, for many years, for at least 40 years, uh, you had a you had a very traditional leadership of the extremist movements in this country. You see the people on the screen. Uh, you can you can look them up and see. But uh, they most of them went off the scene uh, uh, around uh, the early 2000s. And between 2004 and really 2015, there was only there was really only one national leader uh, in the extremist movement that could be called a national leader. And what happened was that you had a whole new generation come along in 2015. You had people like Richard Spencer with the National Policy Institute. Uh, you've probably heard of him. He's the one that coined the term all right. Uh, but uh, young, young uh, and uh, uh, you know, savvy, internet savvy type groups that were, were uh, using the internet and social media extensively, the Daily Stormer, once one of the largest uh, uh, extremist groups in the country, they uh, have had trouble finding uh, uh, space online after after uh, Charlottesville. But uh, they, they uh, the leader of this group tried to to uh, uh, did this FAQ, and he put in you know who he thought were the the people involved with the with this movement. You see some different ones uh, from this time in 2015 on where you have the old national white nationalist movement, but you also have conspiracy theorists, you have gamers, you have uh, these guys, the manosphere, uh, disillusion with feminism and society, and the troll culture, the people that are on 4chan and 8chan, which is really the sewer system of the internet. Uh, they were very active in the 2016 campaign uh, targeting anyone who who uh, said anything or or wrote any articles against uh, then candidate Trump, uh, they even uh, uh, you know gave themselves badges for participating in the meme war, and you also see the changing times. That uh, for example, here on the right, you see about uh, five years before Charlottesville, you see this guy with a shield and the swastika, and then. At Charlottesville, you didn't see the swastika anymore. You saw the Odin Room, uh, the, the Celtic Cross, which has been part of the white supremacy movement for years, using the German imperial war flag in places where the swastika may be I illegal. Uh, but these are these were some of the newer symbols that, that you see. Uh, and as I said, this, this new young group of, of people that came along with the alt-right were very... Uh, internet savvy, 
you see the popular social media platforms, but now there's also, you've got gaming and, and there's a lot of recruitment done in gaming circles and unfortunately places that we may not even be able to see because they're inside games. Uh, there's a lot going on there. Uh, and then the, the completely alternative platforms, BitChute, for example, taking the place of YouTube with, with people that, that uh, whose material has been been uh, given the ax by YouTube and, and uh, others. There's Omegle, which is another video chatting platform, uh, VK, the Russian social network. Uh, all these are alternative places, and it's particularly Telegram, which is actually the worst, probably the worst site online today. Uh, this is a, a chart from uh, our classes that we do with young people, uh, and you see that uh, at least 70 percent of them uh, see uh, hate online on, a, on a, a daily or weekly basis. That's, that's pretty scary. So uh, TikTok is, although they've tried to clean it up, there are always things uh, uh, lauding, uh, you know, mass shooters such as Brenton Tarrant, the, the uh, Christchurch mosque shooter and, and, and uh, others. You see some of the other things from TikTok. You've got, uh, you know, uh, somebody talking about recipes for napalm and targeting uh, uh, LGBTQ uh, events, and, and uh, you get the range of hate on TikTok, unfortunately. And it's not limited to TikTok, Spotify also. You see, you see uh, playlists that are named after shooters like Elliot Roger, the Santa Barbara uh, University shooter. Uh, so this is just a list of some of the, the social media uh, platforms, the worst ones here on the left, uh, ones that are ongoing concerns that we, we continue to look at, and some of the newest ones, not necessarily new, although some are, but the newest ones that we're, we're finding hate on. Even Roblox, the gaming, uh, gaming site for young kids, has, has seen promotion of hate there. So. What I want to talk to you about really is our remediation efforts, and, and we had a program uh, back in the 90s uh, that was, was designed for a group called the Fourth Reich Skinheads. Now, these were kids that were, were at a high school in Long Beach, California. There were 15 to 15 or so, 18, uh, but they were between the ages of 15 and 20, and they kind of dominated certain areas of their school, uh, but they got they got much deeper. They, they were planning uh, pipe bomb attacks. They were actually manufacturing pipe bombs and things. So what happened was that the, uh, they, they, when they were arrested, most of them were not going to be charged. And there were only three of the 18 kids that were, were going to be charged. But they, uh, the judge and, and you know, the, the prosecutors wanted to find something else that, we could, that, that could be done with them to to send the message. So they, they made them participate in a three-day program, which, uh, which started off in the courtroom with the judge. They had to go and see uh, uh, Schindler's List, which was out at the time, and they had to spend a full day at the Museum of Tolerance, uh, which included my giving them a tour through the museum. They, uh, they heard from a couple of Holocaust survivors, and one of the most unique moments of this, this uh, day was the fact that one of the Holocaust survivors that they heard from after he told his story, he said, why do you, why do you uh, Nazis want to kill my grandchildren? And we got the most surprising reaction out of all these kids. They said, we're not Nazis. Well, they called themselves the forthright skinheads. There was a picture of uh, uh, 15 or 16 of them doing a Hitler salute. But in their minds, they, they weren't Nazis. Uh, but they had a very unique day. And as I said, only three of those that were actually charged, one of them who was considered the leader, Chris Fisher, uh, uh, stayed in contact with myself and one of our Holocaust survivors, Renee Firestone, for, for many years afterwards and, and really turned his life around. So some of the other programs that we've done, we have a new grant at the museum called the One-to-One, -one, an anti-bias program which is unfortunately, I don't have any details yet because we're just starting to get this off the ground. We're getting just starting to get referrals from the justice system. Uh, but this will include a, 
uh, a probably 12 hour program, which will include the Museum of Tolerance. It'll include some uh, inner interaction about, you know, actually writing or talking about some of their experiences and, and so forth. And I, I'd like to have more to tell you about it, but uh, the next time we do one of these, I probably will. Uh, we also do a program called uh, Teen Court, and this is interesting because we have this, this uh, juror training program, and what happens is that, that with the Teen Court, once, once kids are involved in it, then cases that happen in schools and, and the like are actually referred to them. Uh, they get the cases from the courts, the prosecutors, probation. Uh, program involves spending time at the museum, possibly community service, uh, counseling with the parents if necessary. And we've had some very good successes with this where even some of the, some of the uh, participants have, have joined the, uh, the, jury, the jury process that the kids go to. But the, uh, they are bound by whatever determination the, 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 the kid jurors themselves uh, hand out to them. Another program we've done, we did successfully for many years was the National Institute Against Hate Crimes and Terrorism, which we did over 30 of these, I think. Uh, we had uh, usually five or six teams each time we did one. They came from all over the country uh, from, dis from different jurisdictions. They included uh, law enforcement, probation, judicial, public defender, community organizations, and uh, it was a three and a half day program, but most importantly is what the teams did is they then returned to their community and and uh, had to create a project that would would do some good in their community. And you see some examples of them. One team lobbied the state legislature for hate crimes laws in New York, which they didn't have. Uh, they one put out uh, pamphlets to to uh, medical offices, obstetric and pediatric offices. One created billboards. Uh, one, uh, you see the one from Yolo County, got grocery stores to donate bags that students could decorate with anti-hate material and then return, to the, return them to the stores. But they came up with a lot of creative ideas from, uh, from this program that they participated in. Those are only a handful, as I said, we had uh, probably I don't know, 100 plus teams that did that. A very unique program that we had with the museum was we had a situation in Palmdale, Lancaster, California. It's outside Edwards Air Force Base out in the desert. It's a mo mo it was at the time a mostly older white neighborhood, but people were moving out there looking for cheaper sources of housing. And the extremists themselves looked at it and said, this would be a good place to target. And some of the former skinheads that we've worked with over the years uh, said specifically that they targeted this area, uh, sent recruiters and the like. Uh, but law enforcement and some of the, the local administrators saw this and they came to the museum and we put together a program that uh, we worked with them and they went out and then created this share project or stop hate and respect everyone. And they created this bus uh, that was actually administered, it was taken around, a sheriff would go around with it and showed uh, about tw uh, a 40 minute video and then would, would uh, facilitate discussion. I wanna show you just a brief video from that. But what the video included was uh, a uh, former white supremacist, Tim Zoll. Yeah, we'll bring up the video now. These boys have all been in trouble with the law, but they're here at Los Prietos Boys Camp to make sure it doesn't happen again. Here recently in camp, probably like two weeks ago, I made a decision um, to stop gang banging. You could ask anybody in here. This 18-year-old is a former gang member. While he recently made the decision to stop, today's visit from these two men helped seal the deal. I definitely learned racism from certain things that had happened in my life. Timothy Zoll is a former skinhead and was the shot caller of a white supremacist gang for years. After he became a father, he left behind his racist past and started working at the Museum of Tolerance in L.A. That's where he met Matthew Boger, a gay man and former hate crime victim of Zales. 26 years ago, I was a victim of Tim, who was a former white racist. And, you know, as, as for all intents and purposes, Tim thought he left a 13-year-old dead in an alley. 26 years later, while we're both working at the Museum of Tolerance, 
we've discovered who we were to each other back then, in which he was the perpetrator of that, of that hate crime. While their reconnection was initially shocking, the two became friends. Now they share their story of violence and hate in hopes of inspiring forgiveness and understanding. This is not a gay straight issue that I am, that I am trying to address. It is an issue of an intolerance and prejudice. And I think respect, too, is very important respecting people for who they are and I've, I've learned to respect people as individuals rather than as a group. And for these young men, Zal and Boger's story could be the spark that lights the fire to change. So we had, uh, we, this was a very unique, unique, unique program they created, they created and they took it around to schools and the like in the area, uh, very effective. Uh, we also have a program for kids, which I'm not going to have a chance to talk about too much, but we actually go into classrooms and talk to kids about uh, about social media and the perils of social media called combat hate. Uh, we've been doing it online during the pandemic, but we also do it in classrooms. We're doing it here in L.A. and in New York and Chicago and also uh, on the uh, Mobile Museum of Tolerance in Illinois and soon to be a mobile museum in New York as well. Uh, so, uh, but it talks about your social media use, gives some uh, mild examples of hate online and gets the kids to discuss them among themselves and then talk about it with the class, understanding that hate has consequences uh, and uh, gives them an action plan to deal with. And it, it uses an interactive approach, which is good because it actually gets the kids talking uh, we have uh, our app, uh, Digital Terror and Hate. We also have a little pamphlet called Decoding Hate uh, with symbols and things like that uh, that you can download from our website. And with that, it gives me uh, great pleasure to introduce the next speaker. Uh, you heard his introduction that he was in, in, extreme, in the National Socialist Movement for over 25 years. But when he posted a, a website and said he was getting out, uh, I knew that that uh, I needed to talk to him as soon as possible. And uh, within a few days of seeing that, I, I went to meet with him uh, because I knew that this is somebody who could really be uh, a, a beacon of hope and change, and he has not disappointed me. Uh, Jeff Scoop, I've known him for now for three years, and he's doing excellent work, which he's going to talk about uh, with you next. Thank you. Okay, so um, hello and, th and thank you, uh, OJ, OJJDP, for uh, having me and and uh, the excellent presentations by Michael and and Rick and and coming up uh, Lorraine next after after myself. Um, I'm Jeff Scoop with Beyond Barriers, and uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about youth radicalization and prevention today. So first, want to talk about the hows and whys. Anybody can be recruited into a hate group. A little bit about my own personal uh, trajectory, my own lived experience from the past. Um, here you can see in the photos, I, had a, I was involved in this stuff for 27 years. 25 of those years, I was the national leader of the National Socialist Movement. The original fascination for me, what brought me into this organization was a fascination with World War II history and a family connection. Uh, my grandfather fought in the German army in during World War II, and uh, so did my great uncles. So I want to preface that by saying this wasn't something that my family believed in or that they taught me or that I grew up learning. I came from a good family, from a middle class, working class uh, home. And um, this fascination was something I, I knew about. I knew that my grandfather fought in the war and I was intrigued by that. I looked up to him and I, I wanted to learn everything I could about this. Um, so that's my trajectory on one of the reasons why I found my way down that rabbit hole. But literally anyone can be recruited into these type of movements. It doesn't have to be that you had that family history. It doesn't have to be that um, you, you had trauma or abuse in your life. You know, those factors can play a, a it can certainly play a role in it, but um, there's no one reason. And um, a lot of a lot of times, people wonder about these organizations, and they say, "I don't understand why people, you know, join these join these type of groups. You know, they're wildly unpopular. They're on the fringe of society. Why would you Why would you join that?" 
And I want to say that, and I think this is very important because a lot of times when, when you hear people talking about these type of organizations and these groups, you say, they say they were filled with hate. They joined the organization because they hated people and, and things like that. And I came across those type of people in, in my experience as a former leader in the National Socialist Movement. But I want to say, you know, with all sincerity, that was a very small percentage of people that actually joined because they were filled with hate. Hate is developed in these movements. It's fostered in these movements. It's definitely part of it. But it is very rare in my experience uh, from from the lived experience that someone joins it straight out the gate because they hate people. No one joins these movements saying, you know what, I want to wake you know, you don't wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm going to be the bad guy. I want to join the Nazi party. I want to join the Klan. No one does that. You join these movements thinking that you're doing something noble, thinking that you're doing something honorable that you truly believe in and you and you believe in it and all with all of your heart. When you're there and you're embedded in these organizations, it becomes like an echo chamber. It becomes a barrier in your mind that you've literally set up. You've put the barriers there yourself and you've set them up and now you can't see beyond them. This echo chamber, this bubble, this barrier, whatever you want to call it, what that does is everyone that you know is now inside of that. They're inside that echo chamber in that bubble. They've become isolated. Increased isolation will only further radicalize the individuals that are inside of it. Imagine, uh, imagine that everybody that you know, all of your friends, most of your um, colleagues, your associates, everybody that you know is basically in, involved in this organization or in similar organizations. So now you're not seeing or hearing outside influences in some cases, um, and just from my experience, there was people that either their families ostracized them, wouldn't talk with them anymore, or they did that to their families because they were involved in this. It's a very cult-like environment. And I know I, I didn't like that term when I was involved in the movement um, in the far right. I didn't like it when people said this is like a cult. And I, and I had people say that to me, literally um, former girlfriends and things that I, I, I had uh, been with one after another. They said, Jeff, this organization, this, this thing you're involved in is very cult-like. And I got upset and I thought, what is wrong with these girls that I'm seeing? Why do they keep saying this? And I couldn't see it. I could not see it. I thought there was something wrong with them, but there was really, there was something wrong with me. So what, what I think it's important for the public to understand is that these echo chambers increase that isolation. The individuals that are involved in it are completely isolated. They're further radicalizing and that hate certainly is part of it. It's fostered and developed there, but it is not typically the at the entry point. So I, I think that's important to to acknowledge and and uh, an experience. So the journey out of the far right, and I think this is a really important, uh, really important point as well. Hate is learned and it can be unlearned. We're not born racist. We're not born hating people. So we're going to talk a little bit about what works and what doesn't work. What doesn't work is meeting hate with hate or violence with violence. Most of the audience have probably heard um, online the, this whole punch a Nazi thing. Um, it's incredibly ineffective. In fact, what it does is, uh, you know, a lot of times you, pe you hear people say, well, you know, we should go punch a Nazi. We should, we should meet hate with hate and violence with violence. I can tell you from my own personal experience and experiencing a lot of violence during the time that I was involved in, in these movements, every time somebody got punched in the face or every time someone was physically assaulted, that increased morale in the organization that increased that solidarity that pushed them further back into that echo chamber or into that bubble and what that has done is increased radicalization in that subject or in that individual it adhered and it brought cohesion to the group so i'm saying that to the people that are listening today that that is absolutely not a positive tactic i cannot think of even in the work that we do now with Beyond Barriers in helping de-radicalize and disengage people from these organizations, I don't know of not one, not one person that is left from being punched in the face or attacked. Doxing, um, for those that don't know what doxing is, doxing is putting out a person's uh, personal information 
where they live, things like that online, where they work and all that. Now, doxing, I don't believe is effective either. Um, some may argue that doxing to a, a, a small degree has some effectiveness. It, it is more effective in a sense than punching a Nazi. But uh, what we've seen with doxing, and I could, I could tell you from my personal experience of people that have left by being doxed, you could count, I could count them on one hand. Uh, people I know that left or that we've helped leave these type of organizations, we're talking people, you know, numbers in the hundreds um, of people that have left. Doxing, maybe five, maybe six at the most. Um, typically, they're not leaving. And the people that I do know that have left by being doxed by this tactic were people that were not ideologues. They were not really deeply embedded or involved. They were just kind of on the fringe. So in that sense, so the people that would argue that doxing is an effective way of a means of reaching people, Sure, the few people left because of it, but they were not ideologues. They probably would have left anyway. So I don't think it's effective. Shaming and degradation, these are not effective tactics either. When someone feels shamed or degraded or even dehumanized, um, they're they're not going to uh that doesn't work. It doesn't it doesn't mentally connect. What that does is pushes them further back into those echo chambers. And what we're dealing with, and, and the reason why dehumanization is listed on the slide is people in these movements are the dehumanizers they are dehumanizing others they don't realize it or they don't acknowledge it i should say is they don't acknowledge that they're the dehumanizers but doing that back to them dehumanizing them is not going to help them uh change their ways or see other things rehumanization is is um and we'll talk about that in a minute but what 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 does work kindness and compassion rehumanization reconnecting with humanity and this goes back into into my own story and and how i got out personally and one of the um methods one of the main methods that we use in our programs at beyond barriers is that reconnecting with humanity we believe that is more key than just about anything else any other tactic or any other method as far as re, as, as far as reaching people Eventually, open-mindedness coupled with the kindness, compassion, and the understanding of others helped me get to the point where I could hold the space and embrace the courage it took, down, it took to break down the narratives for myself. So transformative change through kindness, compassion, and empathy. No one leaves these movements by getting punched in the face. Here you can see on the slides a picture of me meeting with uh, Mr. Daryl Davis, who is a famous musician who... Um, lights the piano keys on fire he played with jerry lee lewis chuck berry um really incredible meeting with daryl and then right next to that you'll see i'm meeting with dia khan both of these individuals having met with them and how they were able to reach me this was at the time when i was still involved in the national socialist movement daryl davis told me a story about how racism affected him as a child when he was in the boy scouts and how people were pelting him with rocks and and injuring him because he was the only black child that was in that parade in that boy scout parade i'm sitting across from him i'm hearing this story and i'm thinking about my own children and what if something like that would have happened to them when someone is sitting across from you and you're having these interpersonal connections these conversations it is very hard to not let that affect your humanity to not be able to feel or see something Dia Khan, it was a very similar situation. She talked about how racism and hatred and the ideology that I supported, how that made her feel as a child growing up and what that did to her, how it made her feel hated and, and less than and ugly. And I could feel her pain from that conversation. I could feel it. I could feel it in the air, like an energy, a vibe, whatever you want to call it. I could see it in her face. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Those type of interpersonal conversations, those type of, of listening and relational dialogue, that gets you, to, that, that reaches people more powerful than any kind of doxing, than any kind of violence, anything uh, of any other nature. And this is the same method that we use in our, our relational dialogue program to reach others. A myriad of life experience, the kindness and compassion of others, loss of loved ones, and being open-minded to thoughts and opinions of others eventually helped me to de-radicalize and see life in a completely different way. And that's the key to this 
type of, of uh, thinking is to reach people where they're at and get through to them with those interpersonal conversations. On to youth and hate groups, methods of recruitment. And I know we're limited on time here, so I'm gonna go kind of fast on this, but um, video games are one thing and, and Rick already covered that. Um, so we'll, we'll skip that. Memes, a lot of these uh, memes, you can see Pepe the Frog over here. And uh, these are things that are aimed at reaching young people, making it uh, look cool or, or interesting or, or edgy, as they say. Social media, TikTok, Instagram, uh, as Rick mentioned earlier, YouTube reels. These are opportunities for short propaganda clips <clears throat> for people with short attention spans. And uh, as Americans, a lot of people have short attention spans these days. They want their information now, now, now. These are these type of things on social media with these little short clips. Are, are perfect areas where these people are, are able to push their message. Discord chats, Telegram, music, various, all different various genres, traditional methods and old school methods, your stickers, leafleting, pamphlets, uh, rallies, in-person recruitment, all of these things, all of these different methods are still utilized um, by organizations today. Solutions, save the students against anti, violence engagement program. This is a school-centered approach. It's a new model of hall mo monitoring to improve interactions by schools and incorporate um, relational dialogue principles, which I mentioned earlier. It's a civil discourse and conflict resolution training is basically the uh, gist of that. With the impl implementation capabilities of ATAP hall monitors, strategy is to increase the identification of problems and focus on replacing misbehavior with rewarded behavior while using relational dialogue training to increase conversations focused on understanding rather than confrontation, thus reducing violence, bullying, fighting, weapon possession and use while improving overall school climate. Counter narrative messaging projects. This is something Beyond Barriers is very prolific in. We're producing videos and podcasts, even interact, um, excuse me, animated uh, um, work as well. Reconnecting with humanity, immersion programs. Um, Rick Eaton talked a little bit about this with the Museum of Tolerance. Um, bringing people together with bringing the dehumanizers together um, uh, with people that have, uh, excuse me, the immersion programs help break down those um, old hatreds and impair formers or someone who has been a victim of a hate crime, for example, a Holocaust survivor. And um, programs that are similar like Big Brother or Big Sister programs. And I think I'm about out of time, so I will turn it over to Lorraine next. Thank you, everyone. And Lorraine, I think you're muted. I thought I was naturally, I mean, I'm sorry. So um, I wanted to say that I think that um, we've heard a lot of um, information, valuable information this morning um, today about, um, about youth hate crimes, hate groups, and some of the exciting um, responses and solutions that um, have been developed to address some of these concerns, because I think a natural question that follows um, is when youth come into contact with hate groups and that contact results in them committing a hate incident or a hate crime, you know, how, what should our response be? I think one of the challenges that we face is trying to identify and implement an appropriate consequence that both holds youth responsible for their actions, while at the same time provides an educational intervention that's capable of motivating them um, to change some of their attitudes and behaviors. So Michael uh, Lieberman shared um, earlier the most recent data on the incidents of reported hate crimes, which you know provided some strong confirmation that we most of us already knew that hate crimes are, are on the increase. And I found it um, challenging to locate age specific data for offenders. So I appreciated hearing um, Michael's report today, because um, what we know is that 
hate crimes, hate and bias motivated crimes committed by youth have almost doubled over the past six years. And you know, for most youthful offenders, it may be the first time that they've ever acted out on their bias. And as a society, we, pray, we place a high value on holding people responsible for their actions, but we also know that formal processing or incarceration for first time youthful offenders can bring its own long lasting consequences. And in response, uh, many states have developed models for youth diversion programs. There isn't a lot of consistency in the content and approach of these programs. They vary greatly from state to state and in what crimes are covered under any state's diversion program. But where there is some agreement um, is in the overall objectives and the benefits attributed to diversion programs. I'm speaking now in general diversion programs, especially those for first time offenders of nonviolent crimes motivated by bias and hate. So, you know, in general terms, diversion allows youth who commit offenses to be directed away from formal juvenile justice system involvement. And I've listed on the slide here some of uh, these kind of agreed upon benefits that um, we attribute to uh, diversion programs, which is reducing the stigma and the labeling of youth that have been charged with hate incidents. Um, providing some programmatic content that corrects antisocial behavior. Supporting positive long term youth development and importantly, re reducing recid recidivism. Today, so I wanted to take a few minutes to talk about the bias crimes diversion project that was created by the Justice Education Center uh, in Connecticut. The center first created this program back in 2003, and it was created in collaboration with the Connecticut State Judicial Branch. A few years after that, I think it was in 2007, the center underwent a major revision of this program content uh, process and materials so that it could be more clearly based on the extensive evidence-based research that has been done on the most effective ways to reduce biased attitudes, beliefs, and actions. <coughs> Excuse me. You know, I've listed in this slide just a few um, accomplishments of the Justice Education Center, so you can know what the um, center is all about. It began about 43 years ago, and their mission has always been to prevent and reduce crime and violence to improve public safety, strengthen local communities, and then offer young people essential opportunities to achieve and sustain, and, uh, su excuse me, achieve success and sustainable growth. So I'm gonna just give you a little brief. It's hard to really give you a picture of what the program is like, but I wanted just to provide you a, a little bit of overview of the program. Um, first, it is research-based and um, I'm, I'm not sure how time is uh, at this point. Time permitting, I can talk a little bit about the research that um, that bases the theoretical foundation of the program. But if if not, um, as Michael mentioned, I have listed the research um, that is kind of the basis for the the program approach and content uh, in the final slide. Um, so next, the program content and approach is designed to be highly interactive and you know, trying to effectively engage participants in their own learning. It's responsive to the different ways that people learn, and therefore it includes all kinds of different modalities, interactive exercises, video clips, journaling exercises, small group discussions, and opportunities for um, personal reflection. Um, the program in Connecticut is currently delivered by, um, to one, either one on one from one facilitator to one participant or in small groups. And the, the facilitators are trained by the Justice Education Center for use of the curriculum. The Connecticut State Judicial is still a partner on this program. They're currently funding the program for um, adult offenders um, as an alternative to formal processing 
and as a sentencing alternative, and it's also been used as a condition of um, probation. The curriculum that we currently have was designed in such a way that it was um, age appropriate for youthful offenders as well, and Connecticut is now moving in the direction of using it in that way. You know, the there's a small picture in the slide of the facilitator's manual, just to let you know that the um, the entire curriculum is included in the facilitator's manual used by the trainers, and it includes everything. It's a 10 session um, curriculum. Each session is about two hours in length. Uh, and in the manual, um, facilitators have the agendas, all of the interactive exercises, video clips, uh, reflection exercises, workshops, uh, worksheets, handouts and, and evaluation forms. And there's also a participant workbook that we've created that includes everything participants need uh, to do the program. These are the goals of the program, and I'm listing those because the, the goals are linked directly to the activities of the program so that we know that we're accomplishing all of these things. And within each activity that we do, the um, the goals are broken out into objectives, so they're you know we have a, a ways of how of measuring uh, the effective effectiveness of the program. So the first is of course to increase awareness and understanding of the impact of hate on themselves, on their targets, on the community, on families, the family of the um, target, as well as the family of the offender. Um, second is to increase personal motivation. And you'll see in, when I talk that uh, part of what's unique about this program is that it's it's designed to motivate the participant to want to change their own behavior. Um, third is to develop skills, skills on non-biased ways of communicating and interacting with the world, and also skills in managing conflict in productive ways. And then finally, uh, to become aware, to explore, and to mobilize their own individual personal strengths and the resources they have as a foundation that will motivate positive change in themselves. Oops, there we go. Um, I'm, I just want to check time. I, I think I'm not going to go into more detail now about the theoretical basis. I guess I will just say broadly that there has been really decades of active scholarly research uh, investigating the meaning, the measurement, the causes, and the consequences of prejudice. And um, it has attracted a, a great range of theoretical perspectives. And I think this, this study attracts special attention because people seek to understand and remedy the social problems that are associated with prejudice and hate, such as discrimination, inequality, violence, and hate crimes. And um, this diversion program that we've created um, includes a variety of uh, strategies based on that, re re on that research to reduce biased attitudes and behaviors that have, um, that have been proven to be effective in reducing these um, these behaviors and attitudes. So, so I mean, our goal is to really provide an intervention that is capable of motivating them to change their own attitudes and behaviors. So, I thought it would take a few moments to share some of the strategies that. <laughs> that research has identified as the most effective ways to reduce bias and hate. And these things, these strategies really form the basis of our approach. Cooperative learning, of course, is where participating offenders have opportunities to teach and learn from one another. Um, instruction, um, we're talking here about content that increases awareness, empathy, and perspective taking. Um, expert opinion and norm influence. I think bias and hate motivated attitudes and behaviors are powerfully influenced by social norms. So exercises and experiences that build empathy and that communicate that intolerance is not normative for the participants peer group. And then we have awareness, which is 
bias and hate can observe can exist without a person's awareness or endorsement. So activities that increase awareness and consciousness of one's own biases are effective in reducing these attitudes and behaviors. And then three other things, accountability interventions is asking people to really reflect on <clears throat> the concrete reasons they've held in the past for their prejudices and to really, um, again, become more aware and, and, re and reflect on the kinds of thinking that had uh, motivated their behaviors in the past. Targeting emotions is recognizing the link between one's emotional state and expressions of prejudice. So again, we have, we're talking about activities that build empathy, perspective taking, skills in conflict, um, and, uh, and, and managing anger. And then finally, targeting value consistency is that people will resist denigrating others when their own self-worth is affirmed. So people who've affirmed their self image in writing about positive values or who receive positive feedback about their strengths are more likely to act in non bias respectful ways towards others. You know, we, I mentioned that we have 10 modules. These were the kind of titles of each of them. And I would love if I could just give you a sample of what they're like, which I time will not permit me to do that. So I thought I would just give you a brief um, description of a couple of these modules. So we start with things like good beginnings, understanding prejudice and hate, where we're really looking at developing a common language where, for having discussions on these uh, topics, and then also taking these kinds of concepts in words and really linking them to the participants practical live, living experience. Um, so we also um, talk about issues of bias and hate in society and begin to develop understandings of some of these basic concepts of stereotyping of prejudice um, and so on. And then we go down through looking at uh, the impact of hate both on, on the person themselves and on the uh, broader society and community. And we take that to even looking at the extremes of hate. Uh, so some of the, um, I think a, a really useful thing that we uh, developed at the Anti-Defamation League was the pyramid of hate, where you learn that when, um, when behaviors that become commonplace, things like bullying, things like name calling, um, those kinds of things become normative, it's much easier to move up to a more serious kind of bias and prejudicial attitudes. So we're trying to help them understand how hate can escalate from um, things that seem normative to them to more serious extremes of hate. And integrated into all of this program is this um, the strengths perspective, which I think is what makes this program really unique. Um, I think if I talk a, a little trouble, you know, I think it's really one of the um, unique things about this program. The focus on change is integrated throughout and we communally, commu continually communicate the message that change in life is both positive and inevitable and that each person has the power to change themselves and their relationships uh, with others. Now, there's a, a quote here that I think is uh, gives it a little bit of context, which is that a person is more likely to change when they feel actively engaged in in setting goals and in um, in 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 understanding that they have resources in terms of their own personal strengths and the resources they they can use to create change in their own lives. And you know, so we, uh, when you get to the tenth, uh, nine and tenth uh, module, we're doing a lot of uh, work on understanding strengths and having them really look at some of the strengths that they have, working with others to help them identify these kinds of strengths, um, and then using those to set goals for the future. And I, I do want to say that this. Um, this focus on strengths isn't meant in any way to minimize the gravity of uh, bias crimes 
or their impact on individuals in the community. And a significant portion of every session is really attributed to that. But we also um, want admit or understand that uh, bias crime offenders are often seen as villains individuals who are defined and labeled by their offenses and problematic behaviors. And um, by using these internal and external resources and strengths, they are able to mobilize to set goals um, for the future. You know, I, I really am very understanding that it's, it's very hard to convey the scope and the process of this uh, diversion approach, but I would encourage um, anyone who wants to learn a little bit more to contact the Justice Education Center. Um, this is their uh, website, and if you contact their website, the, their contact information is there. Um, I just hope that um, this brief overview provides you with some ideas about how diversion can be used to accomplish what all of us, I think, in education and law enforcement ultimately want, and that is to change the hearts and the minds of those who've engaged in acts of bias and hate and turn them toward more positive and respectful contributions to their own lives and to the lives of that we share as a community. So again, for more information, you can reach out to the Justice Education Center, and you can also contact me as the person who created the curriculum at my um, email, which is tivnl at gmail.com. Thank you. Excellent. So I want to thank everybody, and we have time for Q&A. Um, we're going to work mainly off of the questions that were submitted in advance, but if anybody has additional questions for our panelists, please um, drop them in the chat, which I will be monitoring. So I'm going to start off with, um, so I, I think I'm going to start sending, by fielding this question to Jeff and Lorraine, because Jeff, you talked about transformative change, and Lorraine, you talked about the strategies that motivate change. One of the questions that came up was, are there specific strategies that community members or parents can employ to prevent or intervene with hate crime perpetration? Um, for example, one attendee mentioned the possible uh, mentioned street outreach type programs to proactively engage with youth. Another asked about whether there are strategies for parents or strategies for members of the community to discuss bias with young people. And so I guess I will ask Jeff to start. So a lot of times um, hate and, and these sort of things are based on fear. So having immersion programs, having preventative programs, obviously any kind of preventative program is going to be superior to someone getting radicalized in the first place. So a lot of times if you have interfaith connections or you can have programs at school that are that are teaching about differences and things like that, that is ideal because a lot of times these biases and these these uh, hatreds come from fear and it's that they don't understand one another. So if you are studying about all these different cultures and religions and things like that, I, I think it's highly effective. It helps rehumanize one another and and breach those bridges of understandings. And Lorraine, I don't know if you have anything to add based on your understanding. This is um, to parents? So, yeah, parents or members of the community. Or members of the community. Yeah, I mean, I think probably one of the most important things is try to keep open lines of communication kind of in non-threatening ways, like just uh, create spaces to talk um, with your young people. Um, I think a few years ago, we created uh, a parent guide on hate on the internet that I think may still be available, which um, provided some kind of, I don't know if exercise is the right word, but discussion um, starters that you can have about certain things that uh, children are experiencing online. So I think that would also be helpful. And I would just so, add, Caitlin, oh. the the that I dropped a link in the chat to this guide that I mentioned, this guide that SPLC and American University's Parallel program developed, which is precisely on point, um, pre-radicalization, prevention uh, for parents and caregivers. Wonderful. So something struck me as I was listening to the collective presentations, which is as Jeff talked about the echo chamber and the radicalizing role of having an echo chamber. And I think about, and then 
Rick talked about the prevalence of radicalizing material on social media and paired with the abundance of social media sites. And then I think about my experiences and I think everyone's experiences where people on social media are so much living in an echo chamber. And so those two make me understand why that is such a ripe area for hate to disseminate and then radicalize. So one question that came up is what are the best practices when it comes to social media management to prevent hate? And I'm gonna throw this out to everybody because I can see this going in a variety of different ways from best practices for companies, best practices for parents or schools. Um, and another question that was asked that can be added to this is whether social media can be leveraged as a deterrent or preventative measure. And I'm not sure if anyone wants to take this one first. I can, I can start with the, the, the issue of the preventative measure. I think social media can be used and there, there are a lot of positive places that you can go. The problem is getting the right people there. And unfortunately, I think that's why uh, the programs that we do, the other programs that have been discussed here that, that address kids when they're young, the perils of the internet and what, uh, what they, they either have seen, might see in the future, uh, is very important. You have to uh, you have to explain to them while they're listening why things like this are bad. The uh, the echo chamber issue. Unfortunately, there are social media like Telegram, like like Gab, and others. You're not going to, as Jeff said, you know, you, by hitting them in the face, either literally or or figuratively, you're not. That's not going to make all that much sense. Uh, so it, it's a very dis difficult prospect, and that's why we and others uh, are, you know, trying to create things that we can we can reach them ahead of time. Uh, because uh, unfortunately, once they get into it, uh, and it, it's much like addiction. Until they personally are ready to get out, there's not a great deal that can be done. Kind of along that. When it comes to trying to prevent it, one question that dropped got dropped in the chat that I think is really relevant is we in this conversation we're kind of we're, we're, we're assuming that youth are finding hate or they're interacting or they're coming about it outside of their family. But what happens when it originates in the family? How do we prevent that? Is there is that where schools come into play? Friends? What are our strategies there? I think uh, on that one, interpersonal relationships, having those opportunities, if it's being disseminated in the home and they were raised around that, having experiences with other people in the school system, having those having those interpersonal experiences, those seem to be more powerful than than anything else than reading it out of a book or having a teacher tell you about it. Um, it is it is facilitating those meetings, those interpersonal relationships that knocks down so many barriers. Um, and that's a quick short answer on that one. So I would just add that, oh. that I think we're really relying, Caitlin, on schools to do a lot. Um, and I think in a way we should. Um, we are big supporters of civics education, of uh, talking about voter engagement. I think, unfortunately, this is a time when anti-racism, anti-hate education in schools inclusive education, teaching truth is under attack um, wrongly and very hurtfully it has a, a tremendous harmful impact not to be able to talk about these things honestly um, inside schools. And that is something that we and um, I bet the other panelists are also pushing back against as fiercely as we can. And I'm confident that many of the participants uh, on this call are as well. Michael, this is a question that I'm coming up with um, based on listening to you talk. When you started earlier talking about um, the diversity of state law laws, and then when you talked about these laws that are going on the books about what can be spoken about in school curriculums, um, there's a question that came in from the attendees of whether there are classroom-based or curricular-based lessons that 
teach that exists that teachers can incorporate. But I'm wondering if there is a wider conversation about what type of challenges may be presented and what are strategies in light of the policy environment that we're faced with right now. Yeah, I, I, I really want to let Lorraine to speak about this too. She really is a curriculum expert with um, tremendous experience. But let me just open by saying that it's really important to be able to teach about um, slavery, to be able to teach about oppression in this country. Um, there are many groups that are working on Holocaust education now um, for its universal lessons of the Holocaust, um, what it teaches us in, in a broad range of issues. And to have that now be censored and gag orders um, by state officials not to be able to talk about these things. Uh, there is a big effort that the Southern Poverty Law Center has about teaching hard history. There's a whole curriculum about teaching about slavery. The, our partners at the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery talk about lynching. There was just a federal law um, that was passed by both the House and the Senate on lynching. I hope, and I bet everyone hopes, that there never is going to be a prosecution on lynching, but to be able to say that there have been hundreds of lynchings in different parts of our country, not just the South, and to be able to teach about them is very important. Lorraine, um, more to add on that? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I agree with what you said. It's the challenge I think we face right now uh, in the school. I mean, I think that the, the Anti-Defamation League when I was there and is still, it's still ongoing, they have some wonderful curricular resources that are very relevant and timely that are free uh, on the website. So I, I would say that is a good, that is a good resource. But I think that, you know, the challenge is what Michael just said, which is, you know, it, re it requires the school to really take this seriously and establish a plan that is going to, that is going to enable schools and teachers to have the times to address some of these issues in the classroom. And that is the challenge I think we face at this particular moment in time. So there is a question dropped in the chat that I think maybe uh, may this and part of this may be the answer to the question, but I'll throw it out to you all, which is the question is, is if social media is a facilitator of hate, in addition to being a cause, then the then hate is an underlying illness. And what are our strategies to prevent people from catching that illness? In other words, what are our strategies to prevent people from adopting hate ideologies when they are exposed to it? And I guess I'll add, is that is that what we're talking about when we're talking about school-based curricula? You know, I think bullying is, you know, addressing bullying in schools is an important thing, especially when we're talking about identity based bullying. So it's kind of like a step, you know, uh, maybe a level of the pyramid of hate that I talked about earlier. Um, so I think that addressing these issues when they're when they first appear. I mean, I think that's the same thing with using a diversion program is that you want to address the issues when they first appear and provide an educational intervention to really change the kind of thinking and behavior. And I think we have time for one more question. I'm not getting the signal that we don't. So um, I've got some more specific ones, but I guess I want to throw put this one out and this one is based off of what um, so, Rick, you talked about, Rick and Mike, you guys both talked about the evolution and trends and hate crimes and hate groups over time. And talked about hate, the, the change in hate, hate ideology. If you look at today, what is driving the rise in hate that you both talked about? I'm happy um, to start, Rick, if you want, and, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Um, no, so, the ahead. report that we, we just issued yesterday, sorry, Rick, were you going to? Oh, go ahead. Uh, the report that we just issued yesterday, Caitlin, talks about mainstreaming of hate, right? Rick and uh, his expertise at the Simon Wiesenthal Center, the people that are working there are talking about really uh, some of the worst hate groups. We track them too. But what we are seeing now and what is very dangerous is these democracy attacking mainstreaming of hate that is being absorbed. That's what's happening. On January 6th, the people that attacked democracy and the peaceful transfer of power, the vast majority of them were not members of organized hate groups, but they were brought along um, by that hate, swept along by that hate, 
the anti-government sentiment uh, that brought people into the Capitol, and there needs to be accountability for that. So the mainstreaming of hate that we are seeing now is really the most dangerous trend that comes from our report. Rick, more on that? I would agree with that, and I think the the issues that we saw on January 6th and other places, again, uh, it's it's all fueled by by social media, and there's so many places that 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 happened. Much of what happened on January 6th was was you could see coming from from Parler and and other places where you it's a it's a it's almost like a group uh, a a group thing that that. The more the more you post, the more you read, the more you're reinforced by other people posting it, uh, and believing that they're they're no longer you know a small portion of the uh, of society and of of people. They they feel like they're part of something even bigger than they really are, uh, uh, and and not just with with large scale events like January 6th, but uh, some of these other extremist groups and people posting hate and and some of the imagery that we've seen here and, and recycling that on social media, it gives them this sense that there's, you know, there really is something there and it's not just two or three people out there that, that believe the same way that, that, that they do. Well, thank you for that. Um, it, it, it's, it's a really insightful and a little scary. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna turn this back over to I think Will, who will take it home. Thank you so much, Caitlin. This is actually Alicia again, but I appreciate all of your presentation and thank you so much for facilitating today. Um, so we're going to wrap up today's webinar, but before we do, we just have a few brief reminders. Um, there should be a poll question as you exit the presentation on your right hand side. My colleague Will brought that up about 10 or so minutes ago, so it should still be there on the right. Please fill that out if you have not done so already. A reminder about your certificate. You will receive a certificate in your inbox within the next 24 hours. It is an automated email, so please just remember to check your spam folder if you don't see it in your regular inbox. There is our contact information over at OJJDP's NTAC. If you have any questions about today's presentation, please feel free to reach out to us. Here is also our contact information, as well as some links to sign up for our listserv that you've just, and a link to view some upcoming events on OJJDP's webpage. You can stay connected with OJJDP at the Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube handle listed on the slide. There's also a link to the newsletter and again that you've just listserv on this slide. If you have any training or technical assistance needs, you can go to this link here and request a TA through the TTA 360 platform. And just another reminder that today's event, as well as all of the webinars in this series, have been recorded and they will be posted or are already posted to OJJDP's YouTube channel, as well as the multimedia page. If you have any requests for materials or supporting documents, you can contact the help desk at the email there on the slide. And this is our OJJDP disclaimer for all of the material presented today. Once again, thank you to the presenters. All right, so the next webinar in this series is coming up on April 7th. That is recognizing and combating implicit bias in the juvenile justice system. Educational professionals, educating professionals working with youth. You can register on this slide. And we also have a couple more events coming up this month and next month. We have two webinars with our partners at PBS, um, Raising the Bar on Juvenile Reentry, Way Data Analysts Use Data, and What Young People Say They Need. So that's a continuing series. And then we also have a series with our partners over at the Innocent Justice Foundation on secondary tra trauma and traumatic stress. And there are three webinars left in that series and the links to register are on this slide. Thank you all so much for joining us today. That closes out today's webinar and have a great rest of your afternoon.